All right, so today we are going to discuss survival analysis and sensored data. The learning objectives are to describe what the sensor data is, a term, a sensor data terminology in survival analysis is, and then we'll discuss the Kaplan-Meier survival curve, a log rank test that is used to look at the uh, differences between two survival curves, and uh, the Cox proportional hazards model. That's one of the most popular models in survival data analysis. So in survival data analysis, we are mainly interested in time to event data. And that could include, uh, that in event could include a death or uh, a time for a customer to cancel a subscription or any time or event uh, that we are interested in. And there are many applications of survival analysis. It includes reliability analysis, duration, and particularly time to event analysis. Uh, these set of videos are very useful. I did pause some of them. Uh, other than the regression models section here, uh, these were very useful. Now, uh, first let's define what censoring means. Uh, in terms of um, in the terminology of survival data analysis. So let's take a look at this example. So in this example, there is an event that is happening and we see that uh, in case number six, four, and one. So the axes here represent death uh, or any event that we are interested in. Censoring happens when either the participant or subject of under study uh, uh, drops out of the study. So in this example, it's number five, where uh, the duration of the study was up to this point, the maximum duration of test, this vertical line, uh, but the participant dropped out before that. And if we do not observe the event, for example, death happening before or at the time of the duration of the test, then we say that for this particular participant, we are right censoring the data because we don't have the information on what happened to them after the study was complete. So this is an example of right censoring. We still include these data points, uh, but we don't know what happened after the study. There are also other examples like uh, left censoring and interval censoring, uh, but those are not discussed in detail. Uh, so one example that was used here was brain cancer uh, data, where we have multiple uh, explanatory variables, uh, for example, sex and diagnosis and so on. And what we are interested in looking at is the status, which is whether they had a diagnosis uh, of, of cancer uh, or not. So in this case, the Hodgkin's glioma represents uh, a type of cancer and the menin meningioma represents uh, no cancer. So we have categories of zero and one. So if you look at the count of both zero and one, we see that they are, um, uh, 53 cases for no cancer and 35 for no uh, for cancer. So in this case, for brain cancer data, uh, we have 35 patients who died. So we are interested in looking at the time to uh, that death. So we have that information in terms of the time variable in the data set. So both status and time will help us create the survival data. The survival is uh, defined here. Survival or S of T here is the probability of surviving up to some particular time T. So the large T here, this represents the time of death or any other event that we are considering. And T is some arbitrary number, uh, for example, duration of study, or at any point that we want to know if the person survived or not. So it's a probability of observing uh, the survival. 
Um, and we don't actually know T, uh, the time of death in all cases. Uh, what we do know is Y. So we, we know T in some cases where the deaths happened. And we know in other cases that did not happen during the duration of the study. So in that case, we are looking at uh, the time of censoring. So if uh, the death did not happen during this uh, duration of study, that uh, would probably happen after that, uh, or uh, the time of censoring could also be when the participant drops out. That time would be C. So we would consider the minimum of the time of event or C as Y, and this is what we use for uh, creating the uh, survival data. So uh, delta here would indicate uh, it's part of the survival data, YN and delta N. So YN is uh, whether they died or not. Uh, actually, delta is whether they died or not. YN is the time. So one is that a participant died if the time to death is less than censoring time, and zero if uh, the time to death or event is greater than the censor time. So we take uh, the times and the status, and that makes up the survival data. Uh, next is uh, the Kaplan-Meier survival curves. These are used to understand visually uh, the probability of survival. Uh, without going into the details of the derivation, uh, let's look at three main terms here. Uh, these are dj, uh, which is the time of death, rj, the number of non-censored alive cases at time of death, uh, and qj, the number that die at time dj. So we use this formula to estimate the fraction of those at risk that survive past the death time. So for each participant, D of J would be different. Uh, and we are looking at, uh, at a given uh, time and point, we are looking at how many people were alive and how many people have died. And that time is not instantaneous. That time is during an interval. For example, between zero to four months, how many people have died? Let's say if there is one person who has died, then QJ will be one. And if the total number of people at the time were 10, then RJ would be 10. Uh, any questions? So essentially this formula is used uh, to create the Kaplan-Meier survival curves. And here's an example from the brain cancer data set. So to create the survival uh, data points, um, those were discussed here, the pairs Y N and Delta N, these are created using the serv function in R. So we provide the time column and the status column, uh, and that will create the survival data. Then we provide all of this within the serve fit function, where we are providing the data argument. And using this notation, we are essentially looking for, uh, we are essentially fitting the survival data and then estimating the Kaplan-Meier survival curves using this formula. So as a result, we get this plot. So on x-axis, we have the time. In this case, it is months. And on y-axis, we are looking at the estimated probability of survival, S of t. So here, uh, for example, if you look at the 20th month, uh, the line, the solid line in the middle, this is the main Kaplan-Meier survival curve. And we see that it's roughly uh, about 75%. So at this point, uh, the probability of survival is 75% uh, uh, for the people in this data set. And the dashed lines that we see around uh, this solid line uh, represent the confidence intervals. So 
We can further stratify this curve uh, by uh, any qualitative variable. Uh, for example, we can change that uh, syntax from one to a given uh, variable like sex, and that would then show us uh, what is the survival uh, for females and males in the data set. Now, visually looking at this, we do see uh, that for later months, uh, the, there is a difference in female and male participants uh, in terms of their survival probability. Uh, but we don't really know if they are significantly different or not. To find out if they are statistically uh, or significantly different, uh, we can run the log rank test. Now, log rank test can be run using the serve diff function. So once again, we provide the survival data, time and status under serve function. And here we are interested in the difference between the males and females. So we provide that here and use the serve diff function. Now, as a result, we look at uh, the observed and expected survival cases. So we see that uh, there are a total of 45 female patients and 43 male patients in this brain cancer data set. And we see that 15 of them uh, died uh, for females and 24 males. And this is the expected uh, proportion, uh, not the proportion, expected numbers of uh, patients who would have, uh, uh, would have survived uh, and uh, or would have uh, uh, in, uh, survived in case of males. So based on these numbers, uh, we can uh, estimate this, uh, this formula, which will tell us uh, what is the difference uh, between males and females. So this is uh, the chi-square statistic uh, that is estimated. And then it is compared with a critical uh, chi-square statistic. And based on that, we get a probability, uh, sorry, a p-value of 0.23. So since this is higher than a significance level of uh, 95%, uh, so it is higher than 0.05, we say that we, uh, we fail to reject the null hypothesis that female and male survival probability is different. So essentially, we don't find the evidence to say that they are different. Although in, in the plot, it does seem that later in time, there is a difference, but statistically, we would say that no, that's not the case. They seem to be similar in terms of survival probability. Is that test over the entire time span? So it's not yeah. at any given in interval? Yeah, and my understanding, this is for the entire time span. Yeah, uh, but it is a good point. If we uh, maybe look at different time spans, and maybe there is a surgical test that does that, uh, then we would know better. But, but looking at the plot, it definitely seems to be different uh, on later uh, in time. I guess you could compare the coverage intervals of the different yeah, yeah, that, groups. that's also a good idea. Um, another suggestion in, in this slide is to use uh, the serve minor package for visualization. Uh, previously, we were doing just the base uh, plotting here, uh, but with serve minor package, uh, it also shows us in at the bottom uh, the number of people who are at risk. Uh, and stratify that by the, the sex in this example. Uh, and again, we see the same plot. It also shows us the probability, the p-value uh, that indicates whether they are statistically different or not. Another important function in survival data analysis is called hazard function. The hazard function is a conditional probability. So given that uh, the person has survived up to some time, for example, given that a person has survived for two months, what is the probability that the person is going to die within a given duration? And we generally use a smaller value of delta T 
as you can see here, the limit delta t approaches zero. So we, we use a small uh, interval. So around the time t, uh, we are looking at the risk of deaths or whatever the time to event is. So this hazard function is related to the probability density function, which is defined here. So if you recall from a normal distributions probability density function, it has a certain formula. So this is the same concept. This is the probability density function for the survival probability, but this is not a conditional probability. Hazard function is a conditional probability. So here we're looking at a probability of an event near that is within this interval delta t, uh, that time t should be equal to the probability of surviving until time t multiplied by the probability of an event near time t, given that you have survived until time t. So this is a mouthful, but this is the main relationship. Essentially, we are saying that the hazard function which is the risk of having an event given that you have survived up to some time is equal to this probability density function divided by the probability of survival. Uh, then there is this um, calculus uh, that essentially gives us uh, this relationship. So we know that the relationship between the survival probability and the hazard function uh, is defined in terms of natural logarithm. So here is an example. Uh, consider a constant hazard, for example, radioactive decay. And here we have the hazard function defined as lambda, uh, which means that at any moment, the chance of an event is constant given no event up to that moment. So we have a constant uh, hazard function. In this case, the survival would be exponential based on this uh, formula as we expect. So the survival probability would be uh, exponential uh, in L minus lambda into t. And as a result, the probability density function would be like this. So essentially what we need to know here is that there is a relationship between survival probability and the hazard function, and it is generally defined in terms of uh, natural logarithms. Uh, so we are interested not only in knowing the overall survival probability, but we also want to know what is the effect of other covariates or uh, explanatory variables in our data set. So in case of brain cancer data set, we have information about sex, we have information about other variables that were collected regarding brain cancer. So we want to know what is the effect of those on the hazard function and also on the survival probability. So this is the maximum likelihood method that is defined for the survival data uh, or survival model. Uh, so without going into the details of the uh, of this uh, likelihood formula, the main point here is that we are defining uh, this thing, the probability of dying in any interval, in a, in a tiny interval around yi. So yi is our time of death uh, or time of event. So we are looking at the probability of, uh, of death happening during this time. And for a sensor data point uh, where we don't know if the time, uh, if the event happened, the factor is only the survival probability. So in that case, we don't know about the hazard function. And so based on this, we can, uh, this uh, likelihood uh, function is defined, and then this is used to estimate the values of the regression model next. So proportional hazards uh, is one assumption which is used to define a regression model called as Cox proportional hazards model, uh, which is on the next page. Uh, and it has this, uh, this equation. The assumption is that uh, 
there is separate time dependence from the feature dependence. So we know that uh, there is a baseline hazard. So again, if we discuss the females and males survival probability in the brain cancer data, both females and males have a hazard function, uh, which is given that they have survived up to this time, what is the uh, probability of risk for them? So their hazard functions uh, can be different, but their ratio will remain constant. This is the main assumption in proportional hazards, that this ratio remains constant for this particular uh, problem or the data set. So based on this assumption, we can uh, create uh, these hazard uh, plots. And uh, the way to create them is if we have qualitative features, uh, we can plot the log hazard function for each level of the feature. So for example, for sex, we can plot it for males and females separately. If we have quantitative features, then we first make them qualitative by using the cut value so that we have multiple categories, and then we create the has uh, the plot for each of them separately. So in this example, we have a uh, binary covariate uh, with, with two categories. We have zero and one as categories. Uh, and the log hazard and the survival function under the model are shown in this first uh, row. So we see on x-axis, we have time, and on y-axis, we have the log of the hazard function. And here we have the survival probability on the y-axis. And these are for two different cases, one where x is zero, and which is green, and one where x is one, which is black. And this is for, um, um, I think it is for uncensored data. For the sensor data, we have the bottom row. And here we see that there is a uh, cross here. So they intersect in case of the sensor data. Now, I don't exactly understand why this intersection happens. So if uh, you have something to say, let me know. Maybe I, I misread that part, but I thought that all of this data was censored, at least to some extent. Uh, yeah, I, I think I missed something here. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, they are all censored, uh, uh, uncensored but this is for the proportional hazards assumption. Yeah, so the, the first row is for the proportional hazard assumption, and this is without that assumption. So the assumption is basically looking at the ratio of the hazard uh, functions of the two categories. So if the it is constant, then uh, that is the assumption. So if it is constant, then we get this. Right, so, so I think of that as like, if the time is one variable and then you know, the category is another one, if the proportional hazards assumption is not met, then it's like if you do a um, in linear regression, you do like a, a, a combination variable where it's two variables at once. Yeah, yeah. It's not just time and category, it's time as a function of category. Oh yeah, yeah. So if I can't if we, I can't think of the of the word, but but yeah. 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 So if we do have the assumption met, then we can use the cost proportion hazards model. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for reminding me. Uh yeah. So cost proportion hazards model uses the proportional hazards assumption. And it has uh, this uh, beta parameter that we previously saw right here. And it estimates it without having to specify the form of the hazard function. And it uses this partial likelihood. Um, 
So to do that in R, we use the cox.ph function. Uh, the remaining, uh, this remains the same. Here we are using a single a variable. And based on that, we get uh, this result. So we see the coefficients for uh, the uh, male category here compared to female. And we see uh, the probability is 0.2 with three different tests, log rank and then likelihood and the wall test. And with all three, we know that there is no clear difference uh, between survival of males and females based on this uh, proportional hazard assumption. So what if we add uh, other variables? So we have information on what kind of diagnosis they got and then some brain cancer related variables. When we add them, then we get uh, this result where since the relationship between survival and hazard is uh, defined in terms of logarithms, we can interpret these values using exponents. So the first thing that says this here is uh, the diagnosis. So we have two categories of diagnosis and we find that diagnosis variable has been coded so that the baseline corresponds to menin uh, geoma. So, so we have three actually. So we have LG glioma and Hodgkin's glioma. And we see for Hodgkin's, the value is 2.15. So the exponent on that would be 8.62. So this is the risk associated compared to meningioma for patients who are diagnosed with this uh, Hodgkin's glioma uh, disease. And then uh, uh, there is a, a value or one of the variables which is negative, and that indicates uh, that they are associated with lower risk. So we can uh, now plot the uh, survival curves based on that result, uh, and we can, uh, to make these plots, we are setting the values of other predictors equal to the mean for quantitative variables. And uh, model the mode value for the vector variables. So based on specifying those values, we get this plot. So for each type of uh, diagnosis, we get a different answer. So as we know, compared to meningioma, uh, the Hodgkin's glioma has the uh, has a higher risk. That's why we see a larger uh, a larger drop in the survival curve. Any questions? Uh, I think that's this is the uh, end of the slide. So uh, there were other topics here, but they were not discussed in detail. So this is this is about time to event, and it handles sensor data. Is it only? Can you only use it if the data is censored, or can you still use it even if there's no censoring? Cox proportional hazards model. Just uh, survival analysis in general. I think it can be used if we if we don't have a single uh, point that was censored. I remember there was a uh, model that was fitted to Hunger Games data set. And in there, there were only two survivors. So in that case, uh, every other participant died. So in uh, they used Cox proportional hazards model. So based on the chapter and that example, I think it can be used for even if we have all uh, deaths or event happening. Um, I think the accuracy of that model may be less because we don't have a very good data at that point. Uh, but if we do get mm -hmm. more information, the uh, sensor and uh, the time to um, event uh, information, then obviously the model will be better. But I think technically yeah. to answer your question, I think technically it can be used for data where we have no censoring at all. Right, and and looking back at that one survival graph, 
the confidence intervals got a lot wider yeah. as the population drops off, right? Yeah, that's a good point. So that helps us answering that question that we were discussing before, where uh, overall we see there's no statistical difference. Uh, mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, it does become wider over time. And that's a function of the uh, of the decrease in of the population, right? Yeah. That value R J that that start keeps decreasing over time. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Any other questions, comments? No. No question from my end. So. Thank you again for, for presenting the, the chapter because I was already preparing uh, for today, but what, before I flipped through the sign-up sheet and I discovered you have already signed up, so I really appreciate you leading the discussion today. So I think I uh, will look forward to next week uh, where we'll be looking.